Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the UK's biggest stars. Hartley Sinkoli is the man who's done really everything on TV and radio. He's a broadcaster, journalist and stand-up comedian. He's coming to the Brighton Comedy Festival and he's joining us on the phone now to talk about his life and career. Hardy, how are you doing? I'm very well indeed. Very excited about coming to the seaside because I do like to be presented to the I do like to be presented to the <laughs> Then you've got a brass band and then you've got some tiddly on pom-poms. It's good, isn't it? And especially at this time of the year when it's just getting nice and chilly. It's a bit like Barbados, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, in many ways. Whenever I'm in Brighton, I think, gosh, is this Barbados? <laughs> Particularly when I've had a toot and a crack pint. Um, <laughs> I'd rather be in, Bar- in Brighton than Barbados, to be honest. I nearly moved to Brighton in the night because I nearly was part of the Brixton on the Sea Party. It's a very cool place. I'm ginger and slightly obese, so they wouldn't let me in, you see. Yes, I'm not ginger and I'm not obese, so, but I'm just brown, so they don't let me in most places. <laughs> Particularly anywhere coastal in South East England, they get a bit nervous when we show up. <laughs> <laughs> What's your life like now? Help me with it, because I know you as a broadcaster, as a journalist, as a funny man, but I didn't know you as a stand-up comedian. Is that what you're doing more of now? I suppose it's become a bigger part of the uh, of the kind of the offering. I mean, the truth is, I was never a stand-up. I was on the one show, and folk thought I was a comedian, so they'd ask me, when are you next gigging so we can come and see you? And I spent a year explaining to them I wasn't a comedian, but in a way, that felt quite rude, because... They thought I was, and I was telling them I wasn't, so they felt foolish. Then I spent another year pretending I was about to tour in the town just too far away from them to attend. And I thought, you know what, if enough people think this, perhaps I should just do it. So but, it uh, eight, nine years ago, I started, yeah. So if I'd have met you in Nottingham, you'd say you'd got a gig in Sheffield knowing that it was just an hour too far for me to be bothered to go. I mean, luckily, my knowledge of, uh, of English geography was so exact. <laughs> I could work that one. Also, knowing the train systems as I do, Nottingham to Sheffield is a straightforward train journey. I'd probably said something like, uh, probably I would have gone further further west. I'd have got Brom's go from Nottingham to right. to change it. Right. Right. Down, of course, <laughs> the details are not important. We need to try and move on from being clunk, kind of, you know, clunk, clinging on to detail. <laughs> And what do you talk about? Because, I mean, what I loved about you on The One Show and Five Live, places like that, is that you've got a wit and you've got a charm about you. Is it you just spouting off about whatever's on your mind or is it shticky stuff? Is it gag stuff? What do you do? Well, I don't do gags because, um, I mean, listen, to be honest, there are much better gag mices than me on the circuit. I mean, hundreds of them. Brilliant, brilliant stand-ups in that regard. Um, there are funnier people than me, but... What there isn't, there aren't storytellers. I think I'm quite a good storyteller. And that's a slightly different tradition. Although I've become quite good at stand-up and kind of off the cuff now. So I spend about 20, 25 minutes just riffing with the audience. Because I think I never want to be in that place where I have to check my tour details to see what town I'm in. Right. It should always be obvious where I am. And you get that by making tonight's crowd feel like they've got a show that tomorrow's night's crowd won't get. And that's necessarily so, if you're actually talking to people in the room and having a nice time. Um, But the show is, I always like to see the show because I think it helps me narrow down what I want to talk about. And this year's, see last year's show was called Hardly To Your Love and it was all about falling in love at middle age. (laughs) And it was, I just thought, I honestly thought, you know what, I'm just going to retire now because it was the best show I'd ever done and I didn't think it could get any better. But this show, Big Bang Strikes Again, it's probably better than last year's show, surprisingly. More surprising to me than anyone else, to be honest, because I didn't think I could be any better than last year. But yeah, it's been massive fun. The other thing about this is I've been doing this in Edinburgh for the month where I live. I live in Scotland. Um, and I had nine stories on my set list, and I've never got beyond number three because I spent half an hour of my one hour in Edinburgh just chatting to the crowd. How do you know a direction to make it fun? Is it what they do for a living? How do you make it interesting? Uh, I, I don't really... The problem is, if, okay, the question sort of answers itself in that if I'm thinking about how to make it funny, then it's never going to be funny. Right. And the funny, the, the funny thing is people, folk generally know that you've just thought of that on the spot. They know you've just riffed that. They know that, and they love it. Uh, and also the immediacy of the moment. But I'm, there's a thing about, again, I'm really lucky. My audiences know me, and they're coming to see me. They're not coming for that comedy with somebody they've never heard of. They're right. coming to see Hardy. 
so they're well disposed towards me already and they know how my mind thinks yeah and they want to laugh before they've even got in the room i'm very lucky that way they're kind of on my side to begin with I think that doing stand-up is probably one of the most terrifying gigs. You've done much bigger audiences, millions of people on the telly, millions on the radio. You've got a few hundred in a theatre. I wonder whether it's ten times more terrifying because you've got nowhere to hide. There, I can understand why people think that, but also I think with the greatest respect to my colleagues and across broadcasting and comedy and the rest of it, what we do is an important function in life, but... You know, I am not saving anyone's life. I'm not a social worker, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I'm not even a vet, do you know what I mean? I mean, bless them. You know, and, and neither am I a prime minister, with, you know, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, big farming issues. And Yes, like, let's not talk about uh, him today. This could get us into a very deep hole. Well, a very, I think it wasn't that deep a hole with the problem with the big man. Um, that's what I mean. <laughs> Here's the thing. You ask me how I managed to do keep a, a, an audience occupied. I have got an affliction. This is what my show is about. It's people think it's great being a stand-up. People think it's great being quick-witted. People think it's great being funny. It's not. It's terrible because I can't stop myself. I just did that there. I should have <laughs> let that one go. I shouldn't have mentioned the pig's mouth and yeah. the depth of it. I, I can't help myself. There's a moment where you can make the gag and you go for it. And then that's the problem. That's what the show's about. You can't help it. But people are forgiving. I suppose you could say you're a smart ass and you've made a career out of it. Good for you. But the only part of my anatomy I get no complaints about is my, on my buttons. So that, in that sense, <laughs> in the American sense, I have a smart ass. Yes. <laughs> Now, when we look at your life, it's really interesting. I mean, born in London, but then you moved up to Glasgow. Well, I'm Scottish through and through. I was educated here. You know, I mean, if I was to play international sport, it would be for Scotland. Right. Because of my, I've lived here since I was three, four years old. I, my first language is Scots English. So, <laughs> I, you know, I, you know and I had to adapt that. I had lived in London for 20 years. I've only just come back home three or four years ago. Um, so I spent a half a life in London, and you know I think London's great. It's just not Scotland, you know. And this is my country; these are my people. And I don't really—it's a funny thing. I don't need to explain myself up here. People know, people know what I'm talking about, literally. And I, you know, there's a whole lexicon I had to stop using when I came to London because the thing about London is they choose to understand what they choose to understand. A folk in Scotland watch EastEnders and watch Coronation Street and don't need subtitles. Right. Yet, people in London struggle with the Scottish accent. Mm. So, you know, it's just it's back to my roots, back to my country and back around my people. What a love for England. Some of my best friends know English people. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, I try wherever possible to be supportive of the English. I wonder how the, the act travels between Edinburgh and Brighton. I mean, geographically, they couldn't be further apart. Will you have to change the act slightly, or can you do the same? Some of my favourite stand-up comedians are like Dara O'Brien, um, Sarah Millican, uh, and Janie Godley. You may not have heard of Janie, um, but you've definitely heard of Dara and Sarah. And they're, the three of them, their single greatest strength is the ability to read a room. Right. And... That is to, c to come out and actually take the temperature of the room, realize who's in, what the vibe is, what makes what you can get away with, when you can get away with this sort of language or that sort of language to avoid this, to avoid that, and almost intuitively know what it is. I've seen Dara do it live. He is absolutely astonishing. He knows the room. He's so, he's super bright. I've seen him, yeah. I've seen him do an hour of completely rifted material. Credit. Dara is super intelligent and a lovely, affable, charming guy. I just wish so, he'd slow down a bit. That's the only thing I always say to him. Sometimes it's almost exhausting. It's like a Ken Dodd show in an hour. <laughs> I know, but also like socially, when you're sitting having dinner with him, it's like, just slow down. Stop trying to eat and listen to you at the same time. Um, he's a great guy. And the um, other thing is, he's not as old as his face looks. I was always amazed that we're about the same age. I thought he was sort of 70, 75, something like that. It's extraordinary. That was younger than me. I found it rather depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so much more successful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you could have read that because there again, Brighton to me feels, although it's a town, it feels like a city audience. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah. But Brighton feels like London to me. And I guess they're transient or, cities, aren't they? London, Brighton, Edinburgh—they're places where people are coming to see comedy, opposed to people yeah. who necessarily live there. But also the fact that it's couched within the festival, yeah, is again a different commodity. So I played Run Call the other night first day of the tour and 
that's you know, a lovely crowd. It could have been sweeter, warmer, more engaging. But that was like the only thing on in Mum Corner that weekend. Right. Whereas in the comedy <laughs> festival, you've got a choice of places to go. And it's slightly different in that it will be less of my crowd and more of a comedy crowd. Yeah. So I'm aware that I need to be funny for them. And then, of course, the other guys are going to want to come and see you. Does that make you nervous or is that thrilling? Alistair McGowan came in to the Edinburgh show and I was a bit... I don't really get nervous. Like I say, I'm going to do the thing I do and I'll do it as well as I can because it matters to me. Yeah. So that's all I can do. Um, but Alice was just lovely about it. I was just really quite blown away. And then interestingly, a friend of mine came in who saw my first ever stand-up run and then this one, and he couldn't believe how much it improved it. Thank God it's improving, you know, kind of getting better at learning all the time. Um, but the more you learn, the more you realise there is to learn. Right. You know? And, you know, it's, I mean, I go and see a lot of colleagues, you know, that, I love it. There's nothing going nice. I went to see David O'Doherty, and if any of your listeners get the chance to go and see David, Honestly, I was going to see him six weeks ago and I nearly cancelled the tour Like as I walked out. I thought, wow. I will never be like 10% <laughs> as funny as him. Why am I even pretending? Um, and then he told me afterwards just to keep going because he needs the competition. What for you is the most thrilling? TV, live TV, you've done a lot of that. Live radio, pre-recorded radio, standing on stage live. Uh, okay, it's interesting. We They're often characterised as being different experiences. Um, I would just spin the bottle a little bit and suggest to you that they're all the same experience. What thrills me is storytelling. What thrills me is engaging with audience. We use the word community a lot. Yeah. And actually, community is uh, about people bonding and joining and having a shared experience. That's what I hope to create every night on stage, every time I broadcast on radio or telly, every time I write a book, every time I write a piece, any time I do anything. Every time I cook a meal, you should bring people together. And that's actually the single most important thing. If there's any worth, if there's any gold left in, at the end of the panning of thy life, it should be that. That should be the little thing that glistens and sparkles and knocks the grit and the dirt is the fact that all you ever tend to do is bring people together and make them for an hour yeah. or two hours or amount of time to feel bonded and together and to realize that in our own lives, in our own self-lived experiences, there also exists the experiences of others because if we can share together for now if folk invited to watch a fat brown fellow with a turban and a pirate beard talk <laughs> and they can engage with that there's surely a wider commonality amongst all people you know you make a good point there for me you were one of the first broadcasters that made us realize that we are all the same and we are one people your heritage lies in the punjab with your parents but you're just one of us i think people in the past have made the mistake of seeing differences not similarities and you were really the bastion of that weren't you bringing that to tv well, and radio you actually left a line from one of my shows which is i'm all about uh, my first tour was always I sort of ended the show by talking about looking at similarities and, and rather than differences. I think, well, listen, my favourite film is a film called The Godfather. Right. Um, about an Italian American gangster whose family in Port Olive Oil. I've done none of those things. I am none of those things. <laughs> Yet, it's my favourite film. I engage with every scene and every beat of that movie. Yeah. Why is that? Because story is universal. That isn't about being an American or an Italian or a gangster. It's actually about a man. And that's what I am, and a man's journey and his own internal dialogue and dilemmas and all the rest of it. Mm. And this is what we need to discover that, you know, listen, I just bumped into uh, an MP friend of mine, one of the SMD MPs, who's going over to Turkey on holiday and staying in the hotel near the beach where that Syrian kid was washed up. Right. Now, why did that one child change the entire course of history mm. where millions of refugees for years have been treading across desert and crossing seas to try and find a home for themselves. Because in that child, we all saw our own family. We all saw our own life, you know? Yeah. And that is what story is about. Good or bad, you know? We yeah. chimed with that, you know? And that's the power of community. And in this day and age, I, you know, politics is difficult to avoid in conversations about community, but it does feel to me that our communities are being broken down. Mm. But actually, th there are other people to break down. We create our communities. And if we choose to convene, albeit a hundred folk in a Brighton theatre 
to, to do a bit of comedy. That's community and that's strength. A yeah. hundred people together are stronger than a hundred people apart. Young people now think nothing of being in a class of 14 different races, 14 different languages, 14 different types of people, sexual orientation, cultures. It is amazing and it's just normal now and that's where we need to get. I think it's old people and older generations that are the problem, isn't it? Well, it's interesting. Scotland, if you broke down the vote, the, the referendum vote, um, youngsters voted overwhelmingly yes and the old folk voted no. So in a sense, you know, the older generation held the younger generation back if your perception is, is one uh, it's the same as mine but equally my 17 year old daughter when she was 12 came home and said she was in a play with a guy and she had to kiss the guy and I was being the pretend dad being angry and she was that's okay he's gay you're fine I kind of thought you're 12 right and that's not a problem for you yeah you know this language when I was 12 years old a gay is what you used to beat someone up even if they weren't gay mm. you'd call them gay and yeah you know, how, you know, we think the, the world isn't getting any better. As much as technology accelerates and overtakes us, like you say, bolt out the blocks, you know what? We still have a degree of morality. My kids, your kids, our, our kids still know that sexuality, gender, race, and stuff still matter. One of the things I can't stand, and the place I saw it the worst, was the BBC for box ticking, giving women jobs who aren't qualified because they need women or giving Asian people jobs because they need to tick a box. For me, all that does is underscore that the people who are actually good at doing it, they become undermined by it. That's no different from what they've been doing with men. Men that didn't deserve the jobs, that didn't get the jobs for the decade. Right. Do you know what I mean? So it's because we perceive men as being the norm and acceptable. I mean, they were shockingly... Beige, vanilla, talentless men who work for the BBC. Yeah. You know? And also, I, I personally believe in a degree of positive discrimination because I believe it makes people think about who they're hiring. The patriarchy, the power of the patriarchy is massive. You know, mm. are we really saying, you and I, intelligent men, are we really saying that the reason that there are 75%, 73% male politicians is because men are better than women to that extent? No, no. No. We don't believe that. So why why are there so many more men than women, almost, you know, three to one? I mean, is that the case? Something stopping those women coming through, isn't it? Do you know what I also think, though, with that? When I look at Prime Minister's questions on a Wednesday, I think maybe it's just that women are smarter, that they don't want to get involved in all the shenanigans and nonsense that goes on, whereas men are going to sit there willy-waggling and pretending that they're big men. Well, you see, you've said willy-waggling, and then you, you told me not to talk about the pig's head. Um, <laughs> here's the thing. If you look at government, if you look at parliaments, like the Scottish parliaments can situate it, I mean, geographically, rather physically, the, the chamber itself is circular and non-confrontational. You go around the world, those sorts of parliament buildings where it's not face-to-face, -face, across a dispatch box, yep. is, better, is a better environment for women to flourish in. Mm. And I say to you that if we think it's a waste of time, if, we, if it wasn't women we were talking about, imagine we lived in a country that was 50% black and 50% white. And we didn't have representation of our black people because we thought, you know what, it's not for them. We wouldn't write that off. We would change the thing that wasn't for them yep. to make it more equal, to get half our population. This is worse than harm. We're now talking about the majority of our population being overlooked. Yeah. But also this, ask yourself, well, so David Dimbleby, he was actually a friend of mine, and a man I respect and adore and love at 75 on the telly. Show me a 75-year-old woman with the exception of Mary Berry on the telly. Hmm. Women disappear at 50. Something happens. And it needs to stop happening. And ag again, it's not the public, it's the people making the decision. So where is the root of the problem? Is it because the top of these organisations, is not just the BBC, it's governments, it's council, it's any public service, it seems. Is it because it's ran by too many white middle class university graduate men at the top? Is that the f fundamental issue with all of this? Peter Bazalgek, um, an old boss of mine from way back in the, in the, the 90s, referred to, he's now head of the Arts Council, he talks about things being too pale, uh, stale, and male. You know, oh, and that's, that's never good. heard that, that's good. <laughs> yeah, you very know, good. Um, but, but that's, but again, we need to be aware of the fact that this is a majority Caucasian country. The majority of people involved should be Caucasian, that's the correct thing, you know? I've no qualms with that, but I'm just saying, if we want, I mean, look at, look 
at our economy, look at our world, look at our politics. If we really did have the best people doing it, would we be in this state? I ask you, if half the board and the Royal Bank of Scotland were women, would they have bought Indian Admiral? Would they have become the leper bank that they are now? I would argue no. Would Barclays have been in the state? Would Lehman Brothers have gone down if half the board were women? Mm. I don't think so. It's not about gender, it's about balance. Right. And fair representation of demographics, that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Baby, I'm a feminist, so shall we? Yeah, with it. me too. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just about actually, you know, does someone's sexuality have anything, you know, someone's gay or straight, does that mean they're a good politician or a good journalist? Or good nurse? Mm. Obviously not. So how does someone's gender have any bearing on the output of their job? Yeah. Are women less intelligent than men? Because if you listen to some folk who believe, actually believe women have, have got the ability, they sometimes turn out to be apologists and patriarchy. Yeah. You know, I grew up in an age where I still remember when I first joined the BBC that female secretaries would get their bums slapped by male bosses. Right. Now, I found that weird at the time, but I find it even weirder now when you grow older and you understand politics a little bit. These incremental changes, the fact that, you know, we have, you know, we've had a Margaret Thatcher, the fact that we've got a Theresa May, the fact that there's, you know, there are more prominent women, being successful, changes the outlook. The fact that there are openly gay men and women everywhere. I mean, can you imagine as kids an openly lesbian woman presenting a television program mm. it just wouldn't have happened right you know it's just not an issue anymore you know and you know what listen America's got a black prime minister president you know I mean that's that was unheard of and yet still they're a country driven and riven by racism yeah I just think the way he's treated as a president is unbelievable you, you know what I mean yeah it's I despicable America's a fundamentally racist country. Yeah. And how can it not be? It's predicated on the subjugation of uh, the Native Americans, which was a racist act. How can it not be anything but that? This is also a country where you can't show a breast on TV after nine o'clock, let alone before, yet their number one business is porn, riddled with hypocrisy, isn't it? But, but also, you know, you can you know, you can, you can't show a breast, but you can go buy a gun. Right. Yes. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's you doing Chris Lock thing, where he says don't you know charge you know, don't don't ban guns just charge ten thousand dollars for each bullet you're quite <laughs> right it's a very good point I, mean, but I hate you but I don't you know I'm going to save up I'm going to get three jobs to save up to buy a bullet to kill you you know that's a great I mean, great line America's and America's the policeman of the world you know yeah. that's, they want, that's what they want to export to Iraq and Afghanistan really yeah. that's why we're fighting illegal wars in the Middle East Listen, I've really loved talking to you. I can't wait to see you right live. I'm sorry I haven't seen it up to now, but you're back on tour. And uh, have you got a website where we can find out the full tour details? Obviously, you're doing the Brighton Comedy Festival. It's uh, via So Comedy. So, um, so Comedy. So right. Graham Norton's company. Brilliant. Hardeep Singh Kohli is uh, a hugely entertaining man. Witty, insightful, and uh, a great presenter as well. Are we going to see you back on The One Show in the near future? Uh, probably not. I'm not so keen on I do Sunday morning live, actually. I do the interviews on Sunday morning live. I thought you were really great at that and again you brought um, an interesting take on many of their incredibly dull items well thank you yeah but I think um, dull is our BBC prime time scene spot to live these days so good luck with that <laughs> Arneep Singh Kohli one of my favourite people good to talk to you thank you listen um, I really appreciate your very sweet kind man do come to the show yeah I'd love to thanks very much yeah